I'm Regina Healy, a trustee of the Brookline Public Library, the trustees of the initiators and parents of Brookline Reads, which is an annual celebration of one book, um, which the Brookline Public is invited to read and discuss. This year, as I'm sure all of you know, the book is Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railway. Tonight is the third event in a series of four Brookline Reads events, which uh, will culminate with the actual appearance of the author himself at Brookline High School on April 25th at 7 p.m. And by the way, I, I hope you all signed up for that because as you know, coming in here tonight is important to be on the list. Um, and, and, and Mr. Whitehead will answer questions and audience questions in some books and give us a talk. As part of the Underground Railway theme, um, we are tonight considering the economic impacts of racism for both African Americans and European Americans. How does one benefit or lose at the uh, expense of the other? Uh, how does, uh, what are the costs? And, and as an aside, which I just thought of before I came here tonight, I'm from Lowell, and I never thought about where the cotton for the mills came from. I always thought about the backs of the women in the mills but actually there were other backs involved in this story too. Um, are the economic distinctions in the Boston area different from those in uh, the on nationally? Uh, the panel is likely to spend, to shed some light on that question. I'm especially proud to introduce Nancy Gertner, whom I've known and admired for years. You should have you better speak into the microphone. Yeah. 10 years. <laughs> Judge Gertner served on the federal bench in Massachusetts for 17 years, and prior to her judgeship, she had a most distinguished career as an erudite, fearless, and vigorously successful advocate who lit litigated high-stakes criminal cases and groundbreaking civil matters, and once in a great while got paid, I think. Um, <laughs> she presently is a professor at Harvard Law School, and here she is. Um, The microphone failed just when she described how long we've known one another, <laughs> which is a good thing. It's wonderful to be here. I am a 30-year resident of Brookline. Just moments ago, I met uh, my son Stevens, uh, Gail Davis, my son Stevens' math teacher. Um, so, uh, I mean, just uh, wonderful memories. It's great to be here, but what we're going to do, we don't have a lot of time, and so what I'll do is introduce the three speakers, and then we're also going to have, hear from Gerald Alsh, who is a Brookline firefighter, um, who, because of my screw up, is not up here. So at the end of the three speakers, we'll talk, turn to him. Um, I'll say a few words because I'm incapable of just being a moderator. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, so let me start with, uh, let me introduce all three. Uh, these are very, uh, short introductions. Barry Bluestone is professor of political economy, a founding dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs, uh, and a founding director of the Dukakis Center for Urban Affairs at Northeastern, where he works closely with the former governor, who's one of the most wonderful human beings in the Western world, an upper line resident, and is even more wonderful these days. Just saying. Um, our next speaker will be Patricia Wen, uh, who is most noteworthy for being on my block, living on my block, actually not sure. She is now the spotlight editor of the Boston Globe, uh, and is in fact the author, uh, oh that's good, no, Gerald, come on up, come on up, are you sure? Come on, come on. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Patricia Wynn was the, uh, was the author, was her, I guess it was under her direction that the amazing series in the Boston Globe about race in Boston was published, an extraordinary series, and she'll talk about that. And then the final speaker before Gerald is Margaret Burnham, professor of law at Northeastern University Law School, where she heads the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project. She'll talk about restorative justice We've also been friends for more years than I care to know. 
Um, and the final speaker will be Gerald Alch, who is a, uh, a, a bookline firefighter, who will talk about his not very pleasant experiences in that capacity. So we'll start with Barry. I'm going to be very brief, and um, I'm going to give you lots of numbers. And the um, reason I'm doing that is my late wife, Mary Ellen Colton, introduced me once before a large audience, and she said at the end of her talk, I want you to take, be very careful and be very kind to my husband. He is a trained economist, and he became a trained economist because he had neither the personality nor charm to be an accountant. <laughs> So I'm just going to give you numbers, because that's what I do for a living. So it's been more than 50 years since the March on Washington that some of us may remember attending. More than 50 years since the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. More than 50 years since the passage of the Voting Rights Act. We went through eight years of a black president, Barack Obama, the first black president ever elected in this country. And so with all of this behind us, We'd like to ask the question, how much have we reduced the gap in earnings between blacks and whites? How much have we reduced the gap in income? And how much have we reduced the gap between black America and white America in terms of wealth? Now I must tell you, when I was given this assignment, um, I, was, I thought I had a very good idea of what these numbers would look like. Slow, steady progress. I was wrong. So I took all the numbers I could gather from the US Census and from other more or less reliable sources, and I said, let's first of all look at the male gap in earnings. So we're looking at black versus white. In 1979, um, the total gap, uh, the black-white total differential, was 22%. That is, not controlling for anything. <coughs> differences in education, differences in industry, differences in occupation. There was a 22% uh, gap between black income, black earnings and white earnings. By 1996, we made a lot of progress. It was no longer 22%. The gap had actually expanded to 28%. And by 2017, last year, the last data we have, 27%. So the gap actually increased in the wake of all of this supposed progress. <coughs> So you might say, but hold on a second, what's it due to? Well, obviously it must be due to differences in education, skills, and so forth. No, not true. Only 5% of that gap was explained by differences in education in 1979, and only 6% today. Well, maybe it's due to differences in industry and occupation. You know, whites are in higher paying industries and occupations. Well. That explains about 9% of it in 1979 and about 9% of it in 2017. So that leaves what economists would call the unexplained difference, which is basically the difference due to race, the differences due to racism. In 1979, that racial gap was 7%. In 2017, it was 12%. So the gap is actually growing. Female gap? Similarly, actually back in 1979, because so many more black women were employed than white women, the gap was actually minus 4%. Now it's plus 6%. So it's not as great, but it's uh, also been growing. So why is the gap growing, despite what we thought was such great progress in dealing with race, racial inequities in our country? Well, one is, we have forgotten about anti-discrimination policies. We really enforced them beginning in the 60s. We were more active in doing that. Over the years, we've done less of it. And of course, now we have an administration which seems to have no concern for that at all. A second factor that turns out to be very important has been the decline in unionization. I grew up in Detroit. My father was vice president of the UAW. Uh, I am a UAW member myself. I worked on a Ford assembly line, and I'm very proud of the fact that I built the carburetors for the very first Ford Mustang in 1964. <laughs> Unions have been especially helpful for black workers, uh, and black workers traditionally had a very high rate of unionization. That rate has gone from 36% to 12%, and as a result of the decline, blacks have gone harmed by it more so than whites. And finally, we've had over the last uh, decade or so a slowdown in economic growth. 
So the, uh, the opportunity to grow wages has slowed down dramatically, and we've had no increase in real wages for most working class families now for almost 20 years. What about wealth? Wealth, of course, is, uh, you know, you, you save some of your earnings, and over time you build up wealth. You also, most importantly, build up wealth by buying a home. So what has happened to wealth inequality? Well, in 1983, if we looked at white families and we looked at black families, the typical white family, including all of their home wealth, in terms of averages, and we're going to have some very, very rich white people here that are going to pull the white average up, was $324,000. The average wealth, including home assets, was $67,000 for black families. So in 1983, the ratio was 4.8 to 1. That is, white families had 4.8 times as much wealth. And this is families of all ages over 20 uh, years old. Uh, so 4.6%, 4.8% in 1983. By 2016, the gap is 6.6 .6 to 1. $919,000 on average for whites, $139,000 for blacks. But if you don't look at the average, you look at the medians. So you're looking at the middle family from the poorest to the highest. The gap in 2013 was actually 12.2 to 1. And the most frightening statistic here is in Boston, where the latest numbers suggest that the median uh, real wealth of white families is about $271,000. The median wealth, including home equity, is $8 for black families. 50% of them have debt. And if we look at home ownership rates, which are very important, back in 1986, the ratio of white home ownership rates to black home ownership rates was 1.49, 1 1.49 to 1, one and a half to 1. By 2016, boy, we've gotten lots of black families into homes. Nope, the ratio is now 1.62 to 1. If you look at average family liquid retirement savings, I'm 73, so this is important to me. Back in 1998, Liquid retirement savings of the typical white family was 64,000. For black families, it was 16,000, or a ratio of 4.0 to 1. By 2016, the typical white family has seen its retirement liquid assets rise to 157,000. The typical black family has actually seen their uh, uh, retirement assets decline, and the ratio is now up to 6.0. Three to one. We look at student loan debt. In 1998, the black-white ratio was 0.43 to one. That is, white families had a lot more student debt. By 2016, the ratio is now up to 1.28 to one. Blacks having an average of $14,225 worth of debt, student debt versus 11,000 for whites. And then finally, we can ask questions about income mobility. So far, I've been talking about inequality. What I'm really concerned about, and what I'm looking at now, and I'll be working with WBUR on a series about this, is income mobility. What's the possibility of our children doing better than you? Well, overall, approximately two-thirds of all blacks, 63%, exceed their parents' income after adjustment for inflation by the time they're 30. Okay? But if we look at middle-income black families, only 31% of black children of middle income black families will exceed their parents' income by the time they're 30, as opposed to 68% of white families, of the children of white families. And if you look at uh, those black in middle income class children who actually fall into the lowest quintile, so they go from the middle point of the economy to the lowest 20%, 45% of black children by the time they're 30 who come from middle class black families have moved, in, moved into essentially poverty in the lowest quintile, as opposed to only 16% of white. 45 black, 16%. And finally, 54% of black children who are born into the poorest families, the poorest one fifth or quintile, remain in the bottom quintile once they're adults, over half. Only 31% of white children who grow up in poor families end up in, in poverty. 
So what is my conclusion? One, despite all of the presumed progress we've made in our social sphere, in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, things have gotten much more grim. The earnings gap between black and white families is growing over time. The wealth gap between white and black and white families is soaring. Relative to white families, black families are falling behind in terms of retirement with retirement savings. Black families trying to give their kids uh, a leg up have taken in enormous college debt compared with white families, despite all of our universities, including mine, at Northeastern, telling us what a great job we're doing providing scholarship aid, debt is growing. Intergenerational mobility is much lower for black children than white children. We have a lot more to do if we wanted to defeat the economic impact of racism. Thank you. Well, I guess I would just um, start out by just talking about um, the series that we did, which was published in December, um, also very much attempted to look at data. Much like you're, you're bringing up a lot of national statistics, and we went deep on um, sort of um, on the greater Boston regional statistics. Um, let me just say, though, I think a lot of people ask us what was the genesis of our series. And I, and I want to just say that it was meant to be very local and meant to address one specific thing. Um, what happened was last year, you may recall, there were a couple high profile incidents that really, re really reminded us that Boston still has a race image problem. Whatever you want to say whether Boston's worse or whatever, but the, the image of Boston as a racist place, as a place inhospitable to black people, was, was very much real. Um, this became right around the Super Bowl when um, New England Patriots were playing the Atlanta Falcons. I don't know if you remember, there was the uh, Saturday Night Live comedian, Michael Che, made the comment, I can't wait to see the blackest city in America beat the most racist city I've ever been to. And that, you know, while some black, some white people were like, how dare he say that? We've changed so much. This is not the same city. A lot of black people were nodding their heads and saying, he's right. And, and that just started this whole social media back and forth. And it reminded many of us in the newsroom that the image problem was there. Um, then you had the incident in the summer um, with, uh, oh, Alex, wait, no, um, the, 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 the Baltimore Orioles player, um, Jones. Adam Jones, I was going to say Adam Jones, and um, where some fan called him the N-word, and then that generated a whole number of stories that, again, it also was very interesting how the whole national media picked up on it, then started interviewing other athletes, and it was clear that Boston still had this race image problem. We also conducted, just so you know, our own study, um, and we, uh, we, we basically hired this place to look at, sort of, poll blacks nationally and ask them to assess major cities in terms of how welcoming they were to, uh, what, how they perceived them to be welcoming to people of color. And Boston came in last. And it was, and it was last, the same company did it, you know, two times before in the last seven years, Boston came in last. So what we had in front of us was, okay, is this, this is an image issue that's real. Boston ranks very poorly. Then our question was, is this, is this um, a fair uh, image that Boston suffers from? Has Boston changed a lot and really just the image is outdated? And so that's where we went deep into data. And we decided that that was the only way to really address this issue. We weren't gonna focus on anecdotes or emotion. We were gonna look at data. And, and as you have found, and if you wanna localize it to the Boston scene, that not that much has changed. Um, we looked at 30 years earlier, the Globe actually did a fairly a large, extensive look at race then, and in terms of unemployment rates, um, in terms of the number of black people who hold managerial positions, um, the number of black people in the sort of elite Boston organizations that sort of determine a lot of policies, um, nothing had really changed. And, and that was, um, it was just pretty stunning and surprised many of us, uh, particularly because this is Boston and you think of Boston as progressive and liberal and so forth. 
So anyway, we ended up doing a seven part series and, and in it, I think we uh, tried to just address a lot of the, we, it's one focused on healthcare, one focused on higher education, one focused on sports, um, and we, we really tried to sort of look at the city and why it has the perception and why things haven't changed. And, and to raise one issue, which, you know, I've, one, one thing that's been great, I have to say, is that since the series ran, we, there's, there's six reporters and myself who did the series. We have been invited to like more than 50 forums across this, the, this area to discuss this. And it's been great to see the, the conversation that, it, that it's generated. Um, and, and, and even, for example, i just say one of the issues that's come up is just the issue of like in higher education, how people define diversity. Some people wanting diversity to just, you know, like, well, we have all these people from all over the globe and international diversity and what is sort of American diversity. And we've been trying to raise questions um, along those lines. Um, but anyway, so that's, that was, that's essentially it. And we've been just pleased to see the discussion that this has sparked and hopefully change. Um, there was a particular section that you did on the seaport. Oh, yes. Which was stunning. Yes. Because that would have been a neighborhood. I left the bench in 2011. Yes. Uh, and between 2011 and now, there have been dramatic, it was essentially a wasteland when I left it in 2011, and it's a dramatic change. So this is a new change, which you reported, and described a little right. bit. Right. Well, you know, it's funny. The seaport wasn't even originally, a, you know, one of the seven parts. We hadn't even thought we were going to do it. But when we really looked at the, um, the metrics, you know, the number of, you know, black families that even had, you know, had a mortgage from that area, when we looked at the businesses, we realized that there was this, these, this ex billions and billions of dollars of public money had gone into helping make the seaport, you know, land that could be developed, and it had turned into basically an all-white enclave. And so it's sort of like we had a chance to build a neighborhood from scratch, and what did we do? And so I think that it was again kind of, so we ended up after realizing that, we thought, no, this has to be a separate day. It's not just going to be tucked in our story about power or it's tucked in our story about something else. It got its own day. It was actually the second day of the series because it was just such a, a vivid example. And aside from being invited places, do you see, has there been any response by political authorities or to actually do something about this? Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, the seventh day was about solutions, and I do think that there have been a number of different things going on. I just think there's not one answer to this, um, so that, uh, but, you know, I have to say, just based on the response that we've been getting so far, you know, I will say that even though the percentage of black people in Boston hasn't changed that much, for either the city of Boston or the greater Boston, in terms of the percentage of black people, I will say in the city of Boston, you do have a, a growth in the last 30 years of the number of Latinos and Asians. So that is how sort of white people are like the minority in Boston. I will say that while that hasn't affected the, the black population, I do think that this is just my opinion only. I feel that part of the, we expected more people to be defensive about our series. We actually expected people, more people to be angry or you know, we're not this. But I think that because you have more people of color living in Boston, that I think the comp people have been more open to this conversation. This is just my theory. Um, and that there are more people, even if you're not black, you know, if you're Latino, Asian, or from another country, or whatever, that at least it seems like people are more open to this, which I think is a very good thing. But I'm not, I'm not sure I'm, I'm right about the cause, but I think that's maybe at least a factor. We can open it up to questions about causes and effects, but let's hear from so, Margaret, who so. uh, will talk about restorative justice. Is that what I'm going to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Margaret will talk about whatever the hell she wants to talk about. You know, I've got, I've got some sort of response. That's about. what it says here. So oh, okay. <laughs> So thank you very much, Nancy, for that nice and warm introduction. <laughs> and as well, uh, it's really a pleasure to be back in uh, Brookline again. I raised my children here. They're all doing wonderfully. As a matter of fact, they're doing so wonderfully that um, my, uh, my daughter moved back to Brookline and her, my wonderful grandchild, who's six years old, is a kindergartner at the Heat School. So I'm back home and very proud to be here. 
Um, so, um, so I just wanted to say, relative to uh, to Barry's, uh, I'm not an economist. Um, I can't give you any. I can't give you any numbers. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Uh, but I just wanted to say, relative to um, Barry's uh, really very dire uh, picture of where we are, uh, I had a couple of comments. Number one, um, on the question of what, you know, if, if we can point to causes, uh, Barry suggested that certainly anti the decline in anti-discrimination policies, um, the decline in unionization, uh, and slower economic growth are two or three causes. I would also add to that, mass incarceration, which obviously has an enormous effect on uh, economic, the economic status of people of color. Uh, and I, I also say, um, at one of Barry's points about uh, income mobility, the, uh, the uh, gap in income mobility based on race, um, there was a recent study that was covered in the New York Times um, that described uh, intergenerational income mobility uh, and the racial gap there. And the most, the most surprising feature of that uh, was the conclusion um, that, uh, that the uh, gap is uh, most, uh, 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 most uh, uh, widest uh, with respect, well, is almost all, all entirely accounted for uh, by African American males, by the drop in, uh, in uh, African American male, uh, males' uh, income status over time, intergenerational uh, over time. So why is that important? Well, it's important because it's a, it speaks a lot to the whole question of you know, what's, what the real cause is, that this is not caused by any kind of you know, uh, fa family uh, uh, problems within families. It's not caused by, as you know, people still like to believe, um, any kind of genetic uh, deficiencies among African Americans, um, because women are doing, uh, keeping a pace. Uh, and it's African American men who are not able to uh, make that uh, gap uh, or make that jump, uh, uh, as we expect, or as we hope and expect, uh, all American families will do uh, from one generation uh, to a more secure future. Simply not able to do it, as a matter of fact, um, as the studies show, uh, dropping uh, in uh, in uh, relative uh, wealth uh, from one generation uh, back to uh, down to the to the next. Um, so that number, two, 271 to 8, uh, is also critical, I think, uh, because what it suggests is obviously the structural, the deeply structural nature of the problem. Um, so now I just want to hook this up. So the work I do, I really actually uh, work with uh, the 20th century uh, race issues in the middle of the 20th century, and my work engages the question uh, why haven't we uh, fully explored the consequences of uh, Jim Crow uh, during the 20th century? Why in the 20th century or uh, now we're in the 21st century haven't we f fully explored the consequences of Jim Crow? And so I, I, what I want to say here relates to the book that uh, is the subject of um, this series, The Underground Railroad. Um, so it's a beautiful book, a uh, beautifully written book, uh, and it's also part of a a uh, series of uh, encounters with the Underground Railroad, uh, both historical as well as fictional, um, that have come out uh, within the last 20 years. Uh, in addition to these um, accounts, these narratives, um, there are also uh, new uh, uh, you know, memorials, uh, uh, historical museums, and, and, and such, uh, that have all uh, promoted uh, the Underground Railroad as a golden moment in American history, uh, which it was. Uh, but you know, I think as we as we reflect on the book um, and 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 the uh, and the power of, of the narration uh, and the story that it tells, uh, we also need to ask ourselves the question: Why are we so drawn to the Underground Railroad story? And what is it keeping? What perhaps is hidden from view? Uh, by our focus on the Underground Railroad story. Um, so uh, in part, you know, the Underground Railroad, it's, it's about, first of all, it's about white agency and white uh, engagement uh, with uh, African American struggle. So in that, re in that respect, it, it, re it reflects a, you know, a, 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 a glorious moment of interracial activity um, in our country. Uh, but it's also, it, 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 you know, at the same time, it's also by promoting and, and highlighting 
uh, the engagement of whites. Of course, it is also um, a, a reflect. It's also a reflection of the a, a common understanding that um, that uh, African Americans uh, perhaps didn't do as much as they could have done for themselves. Um, the other thing about the under, Underground Railroad story, I think, that's really interesting. Uh, is that we think, okay, there was this wonderful, or if not wonderful, dangerous and, um, and, 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 and you know, exciting, but nevertheless um, dangerous uh, and dramatic uh, escape from slavery uh, narrative that covers the whole country. In point of fact, uh, the Underground Railroad is an enti virtually entirely a northern story. It's not a southern story. Uh, very few people escaped from, uh, the, uh, from the south. Um, to the north, maybe a few of the border states, but not many people. So, so we're really talking about um, northern resistance to slavery. Um, and then the, the other thing that I would say about it is that um, uh, that you know we know we know pretty well uh, how many people were affected uh, by the underground railroad because it, because the uh, studies about the railroad came out right after. Uh, the end of the Civil War, like 18, about 20 years after the end of the Civil War, uh, in the 1880s, they first began uh, to collect accounts of the Underground Railroad. Uh, but um, th the reality is, we're talking about 30,000 people, and there were um, 4,000, four, excuse me, 4 million slaves in the United States as of um, 1860. Right, and over the history of slavery, uh, the, two, the 250 year, folks, reflect on this 250 year history of slavery, uh, there are about 8 million African Americans held in bondage in this country. Um, and so we're talking about a very small fraction of individuals who are uh, either self-liberated or, uh, or were part of a, you know, of a, of a, of a liberatory, uh, important as that was, uh, liberatory movement um, in this country. Uh, but by and large, uh, the uh, imperatives of slavery, the system of slavery, the structures of slavery, the law of slavery, remained in place over very, very, without much resistance, over a, with, over a fa very, very long period of time. And so, the, 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 so, so what we're seeing today as we sit here in Brookline in 2018, you have to think about it in the context of that history. And people just don't do that. I mean, the, 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 the continuing downslide has to be cons considered in the context of you know, the most uh, the, 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 the most significant aspect of American history, which was slavery. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I say that, and, and, and then finally, here's my final comment about the Underground Railroad, which is, you know, we read these stories and, you know, we celebrate um, you know, the heroes and condemn the villains. Uh, and, you know, in these uh, Underground Railroad stories, they're really made to be like real villains, you know, super villains. And there's a problem with that as well because it distracts you from the structural nature of what's going on to talk about, you know, the crimes of one individual. Uh, but, but what I want to say here is that, uh, we, and we, you know, we, 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 uh, we honor the choices that people made, white and black, with respect to the Underground. Uh, railroad, and uh, but and we want to say to ourselves um, that that's that's our north star. You know, that's where we would have been on the right side then. Um, but we're in that moment today. We are in that moment today. We are in uh, you know the kind of the numbers that Barry. Uh, there's a story to each one of those numbers. There's a you know a, a, a mind lost to each one of those numbers, right? A person a person in prison for each one of those numbers. And so we're in a moment where, you know, it always looks clearer when you look back and you think, oh, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to tell what you would do here, right? Uh, where the right side and where the wrong side is. Um, and, but and, and our, our current reality is always muddier um, than when we look back. Um, but, you know, even though it looks muddy, actually we are in exactly, precisely the mo same moment today um, that we were in uh, when people made um, choices about whether they were going to uh, continue to endorse and uh, support, even if silently, slavery, or do something to break away um, from that system.
So I don't know. I didn't say anything about restored. You want to say something? No, no. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Thank you. <laughs> our, our final speaker is Gerald Alsham, who is a Brookline firefighter who has some troubling stories to tell. Yeah, I, I actually do. Um, I have to show respect to the both of you, okay? One of the hardest parts that a lot of people are not paying attention to is although you have those statistics, you're not walking the walk. So it's harder to say those statistics are correct or precise. You may want to add to it because it's not precise. The problem lies not with the black individual or the white individual. The problem lies with love. Here's the issue. Just like white America and white people within Massachusetts, and it's true, are afraid to allow young black African Americans to progress. If you're afraid, can you imagine what we are? Put yourself in our shoes. And we live it every day. Every day. See, once you leave here, you're going to forget. You can go home. Me, if I walk down the street, I might get arrested. I might get shot. I did everything that I thought was right in pursuing my career, and because certain individuals did not want to apologize, I'm in the position I'm in, which makes me economically a failure. My credit was right, I was making good money, taking care of my family, and all because they did not want to apologize, I'm here. Don't be afraid to allow me or another young African American to pursue what they want to pursue. They may change everything. But once you stop the progress, you create the numbers you see. What do you mean that they didn't apologize? My situation was, it was a racial situation. I was, I was called uh, uh, an ugly name. I wrote a letter and all I said was, this has to be taken care of. And I think this person should be punished to the point where no one else will do it again. And an apology, that's all I wanted. That's all I needed. But because they refused to do so and said, maybe you heard, maybe you didn't hear it right. Or maybe he wasn't talking to you. But it doesn't matter whether he was talking to me or not, it was said, period. That's the problem. And if you think you're afraid, look at us. We're just as afraid, if not more. Did you lose your job? I lost my job in the process for standing up for what I believe in. They wanted me to apologize. Not only did they want me to apologize, they looked at me like I was the problem. They wanted me to take medication for, for mental health. I was asked to go see a psychiatrist. All because I believed in trying to just make it right. I don't need to see a psychiatrist. I need to see my mom and my dad who lived it. I don't need medication. I need a job to take care of my family then those numbers would change. But if you stop it in the process, this is where we end up. And we don't have to end up here. We don't. I'm asking that each and every one of you, when you leave, to don't just this, don't let this be a ham sandwich where you've eaten it and it's gone. Think about it. Don't look at the color of my skin. Think of me as your son your brother, your father, because if you give them the job, why not give me the job? Give me the same thing. Opportunity is just the same. 
I have an issue, and I respect what you do, with the news media. Because the news media, they over-exaggerate these crimes that some of the individuals in the African American community do. But did, have you seen my issue in the paper? Yes. Some oh, have. A lot haven't. Because they're afraid to write about it. They're afraid to talk about injustice and race in America, or race in Brooklyn. They have power to prevent these things to be written about or even shown on television. They have a power to stop it. So nobody ever really knows. That's a problem. Um, we're, I'm in the process right now. Yes, it, uh, there, there, there is a lawsuit against the town. So there's really not a lot I really want to talk about or I can talk about. But if you go back to what I wrote in the beginning, I did not want to bring a lawsuit to the town. I tried to stop it before it got here. And the powers that be, some of us know what that power is brought it in and thought I was going to just fold. I can't and I won't. There's no reason to. And it's not going to just be me that's going to make a change. It's going to be everyone in the audience. It's going to be you. It's definitely going to be you. And I need it to be you. Do you understand where I'm coming from? I'm off the hook. Okay? <laughs> You're tired, so you're definitely off the hook. But this, this is what's needed from all of us. obliged to meet out were unfair, unjust, and disproportionate. Uh, and I'm, I'm going back and looking at that and writing about it to try to describe what, what happened. One case in particular resonates with what you're talking about. It's a young man who was a charged with felon in possession of a firearm. Serious charge, but not dramatically serious. His guidelines, we were then dealing with federal sentencing guidelines, his guidelines were very high because of three traffic offenses. And the way the guidelines work is that every time you have went to jail on something, the scoring got higher, it looked more and more serious. 30 days was one thing, 60 days. And it was easy enough as a judge to look at the score and say, well, this is the range and sentence him. But I was, in, uh, I was there with someone to take what was on a page without <laughs> scrutiny. And I read the papers underlying this. How could it be three traffic stops? And the three traffic stops were driving after your license was suspended, unaccompanied by a traffic violation. So it wasn't going through a red light. Driving after your license was suspended. How could anyone know that your license was suspended if that's the only charge? And the towns were Wellesley, Brookline, and Dover. And it was clear what was going on. And as a judge, what I said was, I'm not going to count to these. For one thing, if anything, they predicted not violence, they predicted bad driving. And I wasn't in that. And they, and I was not gonna count driving while black. So we, we saw that. We saw people's records and sentences go through the roof, not necessarily because of what they had done, because candidly, my kids were doing a lot of that too, but because of policing in the black community. So they walked into my courtroom with records that were a mile high that were as much the contrivance of who was looking where as it was what they were doing. So mass incarceration clearly is part of the problem. I also, two seconds, want to say that judges are the problem. 70% of civil rights cases fail in federal court. 70%. 
And a, a friend of mine did a study in, in Atlanta. She couldn't figure out why she kept on losing civil rights cases. And so she went ahead and did a study of all the judges in her jurisdiction, Northern District of Georgia. There was one judge that had 100% dismissal of racial harassment cases, 100%. And other judges had between 70 and 90. In one case, I asked her to show me what the 100% was, because I could not, it is unimaginable that every case was, was frivolous. And this was a case of a bar that had been a, a, a white bar, and it became a black bar, but there was still, the leadership was still white. And the leader, the guy who was the manager, was not just using the N-word, that's bad enough. But he was trashing Obama. He was saying, talking about people of color as you know, monkeys. I mean, it was a, an ongoing onslaught. The judge dismissed the case, saying that this was the no ordinary heart, you know, vicissitudes of the workplace. And the notion that that could happen today, I tried to understand how could that happen today. And it was, it was a certain sense in the courts of my colleagues that we were post-racial, that these things didn't matter anymore, that in fact racism was about the aberrant actor. Um, the rest of this was we could roll off our backs. Um, and so the tool to address some of the issues that you're talking about, and Margaret must know about this as well, is an empty tool. So it's uh, to support you. Not, not, to, not to, to, to extend any further, but when you have a situation, too, like when you have a situation where, where you do, you do your job and you say to young African Americans, allow the justice system to do their job, and things like that happen, what do you expect us to do? I'm following the letter of the law, and I'm not going to change that. Now let's see if the law works for me like they keep telling me. Barry wanted to say something, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. You should open it up. Yeah, I, I want 12 seconds. What, what, the reason why I was so sad about the numbers I gave you is that if you think about it, the image of black America in the media, in advertising, in terms of our heroes, Mookie Betts, you know, uh, Oprah, a black president, a black governor of the state, is the image is that things have gotten so much better. Uh, just my, I actually get Vanity Fair magazine, my wife, my late wife got it, and you know, half the advertisements have black people in it, even interracial couples in it. And so when you look at the actual numbers, they just don't correlate with the image. And this question of image versus reality, it's the same thing with, with the Underground Railroad. Hooray for all the churches that were behind it. But the fact, as Margaret said, is, the Underground Railroad didn't carry very many passengers. But we have an image that white America really did incredible things to try and free slaves. Some did. But the fact is, is the image of our movement toward racial equality uh, is belied by the statistics. Why don't we open it up to questions? Um, I'll go around the room. We'll start here. Yeah, yeah. We need to speak loud. Yeah, I will try. <laughs> First of all, I want to say that what this gentleman, gentleman present now, I think we know about this. We feel this and, you know, it, it, it cannot be ignored. As well, it's like continue the same. In the same, in the black people is really stay in the same move, move, more. And they don't move up or down, or they just going to the street. But why it's going on? It didn't change this. I was just observing and thinking about this, not only today, but for many, many years in many wrong episodes. In, the, in my understanding, first of all, I would like to ask everyone opinion. Is this it seems like it's between white and black, but this is what the, we hear always, white and black, black and white. It seems that among <coughs> white people is everything fine. No one is abused. In white people who are prosperous, have the truth, they have reality, 
think of everything when it left those hands. But it's not like this. Abuse is going on this one in, uh, among white people, by white people. And they don't take a lot of time because some other people might say, I just will wrap up this. Then, um, sorry. Well, then, then it wouldn't be among people, in, among white people, just peace, understanding, and good treatment as not white and black, as humanity. We all proud of the humanity. Right. But we, some people, some of us, acting worse than anyone. Therefore, we degrade even if our white if we become more than Thank you. And I want to understand. No, in until it wouldn't be set up, at least, at least in the, uh, around the white people, then this is will be open the gate for the black people. Because this is the attitude, this is the mentality, yeah. and this is just selfish in power, and this is what is the Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone have a question? A question would be good. Yes, um, Patricia. When you when you when you presented this idea for this massive series to the paper, um, what was the reaction, and how did it change um, over the time that you worked on it? And when you think about the panelists and, and, and the readers reading these pieces, what did what did you think, and what really happened? Well, just so you know, the idea for it actually, so I was uh, named the spotlight editor around May of last year. And um, just within, I want to say a few days or a week, um, the editor-in-chief of The Globe, Brian McGrory, came over to my desk. And we were all aware of all these sort of high-profile stories in the paper about Boston's reputation. And he said to me, you know, what do you say we do a deep dive on race? Let's, let's look, and, and he reminded me of a series we'd done 30 years ago. And I have to tell you, as a, as a first project, as a spotlight editor, it seemed a little daunting, like, oh my gosh, race? Yeah. Um, but I remember, too, then, there's a columnist for The Globe, Renee Graham. She had just written a column about uh, her sense of race in Boston. And so I remembered as I was contemplating this, I mean, we hadn't, like, completely green light at the idea of doing this. I said to Renee, will you have lunch with me? I need to talk to you. I want to say, well, how would you do it? How would you prove this? I mean, it's, it's hard. You know, race is a very, you know, how, how do you define racism? How do you measure racism? Um, anyway, so I remember meeting with her, and then I started talking to a couple reporters about just preliminarily getting some statistics and looking and looking at the series we did 30 years ago and trying to measure, you know, apples to apples, what had changed, what hadn't changed. Um, and then we assembled a team. It had to be a racially diverse team. So we um, brought some reporters from the metro section. There were six of us. We were, we were, there were two black reporters, well, one Asian reporter, then myself, and then three white reporters. And it was a really interesting process, you know? We all had to talk and debate, and we might have different reactions to photos that were used, headline proposals, and so forth. But um, eventually, it all, you know, over a six-month period, came together. How did, you, how did your perception of the world change after that whole series? And you're dealing with, you know, your, even your reporters. I think... For me, I think very vividly was displayed to me the issue of power in Boston and how power is very white in this area. Um, and one of the most vivid things actually, this may sound really shallow, but I think it actually is deeper than that. But um, there was a time, Akila Johnson was one of the reporters who wrote day one, and she started looking at the um, tourism videos, the videos that are put out on the, on the website. So like if you were thinking of, you know, you're from Minnesota and you want to you want to visit Boston and you go to the tourist website, this was the video. And the Boston video that was put up there was all like basically full of white people, you know, going to Faneuil Hall and checking into a hotel. And 
yeah. I mean, the, the, like, the few people of color were, I mean, like serving food or something like that. And, and we were looking at this and thinking, wow. And then we started looking at the promotional tourist videos put out by other tourist convention bureaus of Chicago, of New York, of San Francisco, and uh, Philadelphia. And they were so much more diverse and colorful. Mm -hmm. and, and then we thought to ourselves, and, and what I thought was, OK, forget even what this means about the image of Boston. I kept thinking, who was in the room when they hit the approve button for that video? You no, know, who was in the room? And I kept thinking, I mean, how could they have? Because to all of us, it was like, oh my gosh, you mean you think this is a mirror to Boston? I mean, it doesn't look like the Boston that many people know. I mean, it's a, maybe a little sliver of like downtown Boston. But anyway, so I guess my point is, and that's why we, we had a whole day devoted to power and economic and, biz and, and um, political power, and why it is that this is a, a region that it's, it's just so white in, in the legislature, in the, in, the, in the upper ranks of business, and how that affects these things. So, uh, yes. Uh, since we're in Brookline, and we have some panelists who either have, have lived in Brookline or live in Brookline, do you think there's a reputational risk for Brookline, given what has <coughs> happened with the treatment of public safety officers who have been on the front line? Do you think there's a reputational risk involved for Brookline? What do you mean by the treatment of? The bad treatment of? Yes. The, the bad is being kind. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is yes. The short answer is yes. Especially for, especially for a community that believes it is progressive. Um, I, I, um, whenever we drive through the town and whenever the car is stopped on the side of the road, my husband and I stop to see whether it matches the patterns that we have seen. Uh, we haven't yet intervened because uh, I need Margaret on call. <laughs> but we do have to talk about what to do. Um, there are uh, houses for sale on my block, and we want to think about ways of encouraging uh, families of color to move into our block. How do we do that? What's the incentives? What should we do about it? I mean, it's more than just being nice too, although that's important. It is talking about structural inequality as well. Anybody else want to? Um, I would just add very, very quickly. This is again this question of image versus reality. I don't live in Brooklyn. I live in the Socialist Republic of Cambridge. <laughs> and, um, but we have the same issue on our block. And the fact is, is that I think I've always thought of Brooklyn, you know, as a very progressive community. You know, that's, you know, John F. Kennedy came here. The, you know, uh, the caucus comes out of this community. But the fact is, is that when it gets to the day-to-day. -day, living situation, as you know so well. We don't do that much better than other parts of the country. And that's the issue we have to confront. The image looks good. The reality, not so much. In the back, the lady in the back here. Thank yeah. you. Um, I wanted to just sort of bring it out of philosophy for a moment down to the personal and the realistic. Um, two quick questions. First is, did panelists receive an honorarium did what, the panel? Yeah, did any panelists receive an honorary for that? One, yeah. Wait, a what? <laughs> but we're waiting. We're waiting for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. No. Yeah. Um, I wanted to extend my thanks for coming, for doing that without an honorary. The second thing I wanted to bring up, was touched on briefly, was um, the generational impacts of the economic realities of racism. I wanted to ask Firefighter Alston, I'm aware that you lost your position, your career, <coughs> your pension um, after serving us for a decade and having been yeah, commended for that. Um, and I'm wondering about the generational impacts for you, for your own family, your own children, um, your own grandchildren. If, if, you, if you want to be honest, um, and we, I am going to be honest, the tension and the stress that this, uh, this entire thing put me through caused me to get a divorce. Mm -hmm. The tension and the stress caused on my children, I, I had to figure out a way to prevent my second youngest from committing suicide on several occasions. Um, 
but I didn't change because I needed to show them something different. There may be other families who can't do that. There may be other families who can't prevent the suicide from happening or cannot still be friends with their, with their ex-wife. Um, I, I was able to do so because of my, my parents. My parents, I, my hero is my dad. Not a football player, not, not someone, you know, that not anything that you put on the walls. My parents were and, ha and still are. Where are you from? Um, I, was, I was born and raised in, in, in Roxbury. We traveled in Roxbury and it was just, my dad's actually here. He's, he's still here. <laughs> And yeah, my, my ex-wife would not be my friend. I'd be in trouble and be brought into jail for domestic violence for just having a loud discussion. It affects families, it affects individuals in ways that some people in this audience will never understand and never want to experience. So in, in order for this to stop, we have to stop. We have to look beyond the stereotypical way of thinking. You know, we have to look beyond what these pictures are when they say come to Boston. <laughs> we have to look beyond that. If we don't, then this is this is this, it's gonna continue. Yes. Um, this is kind of a question for the whole panel, but it's it's was generated just a couple of seconds ago and uh, but when you were talking about wanting black people to come onto your block. My question is, and reflective of his program on racism and a very small number of people here are black. Absolutely. Exactly. What about going onto their blocks? What about mixing and treating them just as you would your white neighbors by moving into the, their neighborhoods? What do you think, the panel, talk, look at from the economic perspective, from the historical perspective, from the uh, interpersonal treatment perspective, but isn't it all part of the larger problem of seeing each other as different tribes and competing economically, and just when you alienate somebody, when you see them as a different tribe, it's not human in a way. So I would just ask any of the panelists who wanted to comment on that to discuss how that might have an interplay and how we might make a change through that kind of geographical behavior. You have, and, and I'm sorry for jumping in, but has anybody been around years ago and saw how J Jamaica Plain used to look? Oh, yeah. 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 And, and you saw how Jamaica Plain was, was, was they, they looked at Jamaica Plain as, it was bad. It's bad. But now, everyone started, people started buying three family houses, putting these gardens together, painting these houses. And what you said makes sense. Don't be afraid of what, and I don't, there's no disrespect to you, don't be afraid of what the news media says about <clears throat> these areas. Yeah. Some of these houses are beautiful. Yeah, yeah well, wait, that's, a, that's a fair point. Let's, let's get another question. Can you call me back here? I've had my hand up for the whole time. <laughs> okay, you, you've nodded at me, okay? I'm looking at you. You hear me? Yeah. I will call on you. Well, they do. They call me then. I will call on you, except that I wanted it to mix up so we're not only talking about Gerald's case. You heard me. You, you saw my hand. Go ahead. I will talk. Let's question? call one other person and then we'll come to you. Uh, yeah. I would love to hear from Margaret Byrne about the story of justice. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say it in the <laughs> So I know I, I think I've said you know this is uh, an interesting gathering and obviously um, it's it, this is these are the kinds of hard talks we have to have uh, and they are going to be about specific cases and specific actions just as much as they are going to be about you know the, the long the long historical perspective. Uh, and so, you know, what I think is really interesting, and I'm commenting on, on what we're doing here together in this room, uh, what I think is really interesting is um, we're taking account of a specific case and understanding 
um, the nature of the, the kind of pain that it has created. Uh, and, but, and, and we don't know all the facts, you know, we don't know, uh, nobody knows all the facts. Uh, but it is, uh, uh, you know, part of the full discussion that I think we all have to have and have to, you know, we have to be hard listeners in some of these settings and try to figure out, uh, you know, uh, where we stand and, and, and what wisdom uh, and what learning and knowledge we can bring uh, to, you know, to the, to, the, to the question in general. I want to just say that. Um, so, you know, my project actually, on, on your question, my project is one that, as I say, looks at the 20th century uh, for the reason that uh, Americans don't really know that history. Uh, there's a period of history, my period is 1930 to 1970, that has just gotten lost in the shuffle. And, and my argument essentially here is that until we really fully understand the old Jim Crow, we'll never really figure out what's going on in the new Jim Crow. And so I take my students, I'm a law teacher, I take my students uh, back into these earlier periods to look at what was going on in our legal communities and the uh, experiences of African American communities, uh, how African American communities were experiencing their lives back then, and try to figure out what went wrong, so that, uh, that so and, and what are the t remedies today, um, so that uh, we can uh, begin to uh, take some take corrective action. Oh no, you have to You better call on. Okay. You were going to skip me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Listen. Um, with all due respect, you're in Brookline. This is the Brookline Public Library. I don't know how many people here are from Brookline. I don't really want to hear anything about it. That I don't want to, but I want to hear about Brookline, N not what's happening in Boston. I have asked, I can't tell you how many times, for the globe to put a spotlight on Brookline and let the rest of the world see the kind of sickness that's going on in this town. Gerald is just one example. And if you take what's been happening at that high school in terms of the students, in terms of the leadership, and how they have hired headmasters, and that 40% of the teaching aides are black and Latino, and 70 and 80% are classroom teachers, and how black teachers who apply for jobs they don't get them, or Latino teachers. And I want that to come out in the globe in, with their spotlight team. That's what's going to really make a change. And the White Citizens Council of this community will understand that the world is watching them. You've got the police, you've got the police department, you've got hiring and firing that's going on, just the whole way they hired the superintendent is beyond, any, the new superintendent is beyond anybody's imagination. They found the worst black man that they could find in the country to bring him here and made him a finalist. And everybody knew that he wasn't gonna get hired. The smoke and mirrors. That kind of stuff should be on the front page of the Boston Globe. And I've said that to the Boston Globe. And you know that, Ms. Wayne. Yeah, but John Henry lives here. So I don't care if he lives here. That's right. The other thing is that Brooklyn is under the night. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. I remember in the 70s, we, we would get up and speak, no matter who was around. When I demonstrated with you, Curry, we, we got up and talked in Washington, D.C. against the wall. I've been having my hand up for the whole time. Yeah. Well, I didn't raise my hand, but I just wanted to follow up what Let's stop here. I wanted to follow let, up what, what Mr. Arthur hand. said because I have also experienced discrimination here in Brookline. You haven't. True. The other thing is that these liberals here in Brookline are all under denial, and I'm not saying here in general, but the ones that live here, they don't want to hear that there's racism here in Brookline because it's not something that they want their families to know. Yeah. The other thing is all you have to do is look at the data that Mr. Brooke Ames has about stops, about the proportions, about what is it. The, the data speaks for itself. 
And that's not being, I haven't heard anybody say anything about that, white or black. So in reality, there's a lot of information here in Brookline that is really not shown, read. I haven't seen it in the Times, definitely not in the Globe. It won't be in the Globe. And, 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 you know, nice to see you again, Mr. Barry Black, uh, Bluestone. I work with you at UMass Boston, at the McCormick Institute. In any event, thank you. <laughs> with, I, I, I'm glad you're open. I'm glad to hear what you have to say. I, I really am. I, I feel that, look, at, I'm one person at the Globe, and I am now the editor of the Spotlight team as of last May. Um, well, the first projects we did did deal with race, um, and it required an enormous commitment of resources. When you talk about the Brookline issue, all I can say is that even I get emails, phone calls, notes from people throughout this area, not just Brookline, that complain about acts of racism in their community. That doesn't mean that, um, you know, when, when we go deep on something, there's, there's a lot of communities around here, there's obviously acts of racism in every community. Um, what I can say is that I do think the Globe is committed to doing the best it can. One of the things that we did look at even in the race series was how well we do as a, as a, a newsroom. You can, we wrote about that already. Uh, but but what, what I will say is that you know, we have, as of the beginning of this year, a race and social justice reporter, Megan Irons. It is her job. We have a Facebook page we started called, called Discussing Racism. I think some of the issues around Brookline have been posted there. Um, Megan Irons, I know, is very open to hearing news information, um, information from different people. No, um, unfortunately, we can't, I'm not, I'm not saying we, sh we are not going to cover more deeply about Brookline. I love hearing your candor. I love hearing your openness. And I take these things with me when I go to meetings and so forth. Um, but I also just need you to know that, you know, we don't, we, we don't just, we cover so much of this area. Um, and uh, I do think we are really committed. Yes. Um, one of the things that I've been worrying about, and I tend to worry a lot, um, I heard somebody speak at MIT, a graduate student in artificial intelligence. And, and studying all, here, her, to talk louder. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Stand and, and, and um, she's studying artificial intelligence, and she's black, and she. And I've been reading about it, so it was so shocking to me that an emerging technology is continuing this legacy of slavery, mm -hmm. in that these robots are not recognizing black faces. Mm. And she actually had to wear a white mask oh. to be recognized. So the coding that's going in is bringing in the bias of like the white supremacist, supremacist class that a lot of us in this room Skin color, um, so it's like to me, it, it's just unbelievable that this is happening, and it, it's happening all over the world, where whoever is shooting, which is usually you know, computer, like computer scientists, it tends to be white, you know, men are doing that, and it, I know this country is getting deregulated, but I just don't know what to say. I mean, my heart is breaking
The second thing is, I want to address Ms. Jim, and I'd like to say yes, the Underground Railroad is only a small section. And it doesn't tell the whole story, not only of black people, but any story of survival of people, of, you know, and, and I will talk in colors, of black people, of gray people in this country, which is horrible of yellow people coming into this country, of, of brown people attempting to come into this country and those that have come into this country. I mean, this country was not built on the backs of white people. It was built on the backs of multicolored people. And that's what the current administration has to understand. I was waiting for him to come up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but not just that. The Underground Railroad is a part, and people don't understand, is that a lot of the people that escaped through the un Underground Railroad, they were caught again and brought back down south. Okay. Even the ones that went to Canada. They were, 12 Years of Slave was another book where the man that was free in Canada got thrown back down south. So there's a lot of stories that I've heard. There's a lot of stories of people that never heard they were free. There's a lot of stories that after people were made free were never really free. And Jim Crow is a huge part of that. And people that don't understand what Jim Crow is. It's, it's like after the Holocaust and after the war was over, <coughs> Jews still weren't free. Wow. Jews were still put in the factories. Jews were still treated by second class citizens. So you see, there's so much history that goes on in this country that has gone on in other countries that people don't get. And that people say never forget. Well, they don't forget within their own clan. So when I look at other people, they did. And they stop pointing at others. But there's so much that is happening with the Russians, with the Jews, with Latinos, that we have to come together and remind each other of what's going on, especially in the city. And it's not about underground. There's a very famous saying that goes something like this. It's every citizen's obligation to remember what their neighbor cannot forget. Responding to an email, I know that you got several, and um, I'm, I was impressed that um, you answered my email. I wrote about, um, I'm a teacher, and I spent much of my career in a well-to-do suburb, and I now work with um, urban children, um, 20 minutes down the road, uh, with a, a very um, wonderful program that was started um, by a black computer engineer, and a, um, oh. K. Ferdian, <laughs> computer engineer, and they serve um, many uh, of the communities of color in Boston and support after school programs and tech learning. Um, so, so that's my first thing. I'd like to take a page from your your um, spotlight series and turn over to Professor Bluestone and what solutions, particularly with the anti-discrimination and the union statistics. Are, are very disturbing to me. Um, what would you suggest? Uh, <laughs> you want to end on a cure, Mary? Yeah. <laughs> I think the first thing, and that's why this forum is so important, you have to understand the numbers, you have to understand what's really happening behind the image. And that's why I want to salute Brookline in doing this. Uh, I think the second, the second thing is that there are a lot of things we have to do. Um, we have to enforce strict anti-discrimination uh, laws, which of course the current president, who is a racist and a plutocrat, and I've said publicly a fascist, is not gonna do that. 
Uh, that means we have to get much more political this year, not just here in Brookline, but across the country. We have to change the direction of this country before it gets I think the third thing is um, we have to uh, support a lot of, of organizations that we have stopped, for, stopped supporting, including unions that are organizing workers in the home care industry, in the hotel industry. I'm working with a number of these unions. I think another thing we have to do, because so much of this has to do with segregation, residential segregation, another book I would love to suggest to you is my friend Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, one of the most powerful books um, on the whole question of how the federal government and state and local governments enforce racial segregation. And segregation itself explains a lot of these data. So I think those are the kinds of things we have to do, but I think a lot of it begins by getting much more political than we did before, really fighting very hard to get back to where we started in the 1960s and try and bring that era back, but push it much harder than we did even in the 1960s. Thank you. I think there's a gentleman in the back who wanted to make some announcements. Yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know, I don't know if people know, but Brooklyn has joined an organization, a national network called Government Alliance on Race and Equity, that uses racial equity tools. Boston joined a year and a half, two years ago, and the process is started in Brooklyn. Um, there's a group of people independently, and also the Commission on Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations are looking at all the water articles that are up before town through a racial equity lens. A uh, group that I'm involved with is bringing, confronting race, white supremacy into uh, course into adult education this coming June. It, it should be announced very shortly. And white people challenging racism. Thank you. Joan, how are you doing? And uh, if anyone's interested in being part of our group, they can speak to me afterwards. I want to thank everybody for coming here tonight, particularly the panelists who kept us on our toes. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you. Thank you. I couldn't find it. The elevator was good.